Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be looking at Forex, that is, foreign exchange. Now, okay, this whole foreign exchange, the Canadian exchange rate, and the fluctuation of the Canadian exchange rate really isn't anything new to us. Uh, we've been playing around with these fluctuations, we've been playing around with some of the determinants that cause these fluctuations now for pretty much the whole semester. Um, but here we have all the tools finally, we have everything we need between monetary policy, interest rates, uh, international capital flows, our whole aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, all of that. We have enough that we can really formally and formalize kind of a model for explaining and taking a look at exchange rates. So really that's what this allows us to do and thus that's what we're going to be taking a look at. Um, what exactly are our goals for this video? What are we What are we going to get out of this? Well, first of all, we're going to get out really how to build a model, how to build a market for foreign exchange. And honestly, that's going to be the confusing part. This is going to be where many people get hung up on this model, is that we are not looking at a market for Canadian dollars. We're looking at a market for foreign currency. So... Well, we'll get into that more, but it's a bit of a flip from how you would traditionally kind of think of this situation. So something to kind of keep in mind with that. From there, we'll carry on and we'll take a look at really important determinants of exchange rates. We'll talk about why exchange rates change, why sometimes the US dollar is worth a lot more than the Canadian dollar, why at a few times in history the Canadian dollar has actually been worth more. And we'll take a look at some of the determinants that influence that, and they vary quite broadly in all of their aspects. Well, let's go jump over and let's take a look at starting to build up our model for a uh, foreign exchange. Okay, so the big thing to keep in mind in this is that we are modeling, we are taking a look at the, now uh, let's use the right tool here. We are looking at the market for foreign exchange. So that is when we're talking about the demand, when we're talking about the supply, we're talking about the demand for foreign currency. We're talking about the supply of foreign currency. And in that case there, when we're talking about this, and when we're talking about exchange rates, and we've already kind of set exchange rates in this way, when we're talking about the exchange rate, so exchange rate today, what that's going to be is it's going to be how much domestic currency we give up in order to get one foreign currency, right? And this, this unfortunately, we live in a US-centric world, and often you see exchange rates presented this way as, hey, how many US dollars is one Canadian dollar, right? We look at it that way, and right, this is probably something like about 0 0.87 right now. Well, okay, if we wanted to express that in the way that we wanted to, well, this would be domestic to foreign, so that'd be actually how many Canadian dollars does it take to buy one US dollar? That would be actually about, uh, what would that be? That'd be about 1.15, right? So a little bit of a different way to take a look at it. And like I said, often if you go pull up the US Canadian exchange rate, you'll get something like this, right? And that's because the US dollar is worth a bit more than the Canadian dollar on international markets. But we we want to take a look at it is, no, 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 how many domestic units do I need to buy one foreign unit? And in that way there, we get our exchange rate in this way. And really, yes, okay, we see this a lot in the news, we see this reported a lot, but really from our sense of thinking about prices, this makes a lot more sense to us. Right, And when we think about it, when we're buying a foreign currency, it's just like buying any other good. right? We would think about it in this kind of way. Say you wanted to buy a cup of coffee. Well, you would think about how many Canadian dollars you give up per cup of coffee. right? And in that way there, and right in that case, it would be like $2 per cup of coffee. In the same way when we're talking about exchange rates, it's the same kind of idea. You're saying, okay, how much is it going to cost to buy to buy a foreign or we'll say a US dollar? Well, in the same way as we'd say, okay, how many Canadian dollars to buy a cup of coffee? We'd say, how many Canadian dollars to buy a US dollar? 
And same kind of idea, right? Same kind of ideas with a cup of coffee. It just, we mentally have a harder time with this because we're talking about currency to currency rather than currency to good. But if you think of foreign currencies as just a foreign good, it really helps to kind of cement this whole idea. It really, it really does. It really does help to think of U.S. money not as money, but as just another good that we might want to buy. And kind of keep that in mind, right? U.S. currency is not money in Canada. U.S. money is only money in the U.S. So something to keep in mind as we go through that. And again, the big thing when we're talking about exchange rates, it's always domestic to foreign. Okay, in that case there, what I want to do, I know I just did a Canadian U.S. example, but I don't actually want to do Canadian U.S. as we carry through this video. And the reason being is that, hey, our Canadian dollar, we represent in dollars. Our U.S. dollar, we represent in dollars. And so our units look extremely similar. As a result of that, right, and really what we're talking about is just our market for foreign exchange. So just foreign goods, kind of Canadian dollar to the world. But, okay, that's not really true. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify, and again, just so we can use different currencies, we're going to be taking a look at the Canadian dollar versus the euro, right? And again, that's just so we can have these different symbols so that we can present dollar to euros, and we're not confused by the similarities of them. To start off, in order to frame our whole market for foreign exchange, or hey, in this case here, the foreign exchange we're talking about is euros, we're going to start off by talking about the supply of euros. And we're going to take a look at the supply of euros and really think about, okay, why is foreign exchange being supplied on whole? And really the way that you want to think about this is that, well, hey, whenever... Whenever Europeans, right, and technically we could just say foreigners there, whatever foreign country we're talking about with their foreign currency, whenever foreigners want, oh, oh, let's, let's change that from want to demand Canadian goods. So whenever foreigners, whenever Europeans want or demand Canadian goods, they need... Well, what do they need to buy Canadian goods? They're going to need Canadian dollars. So in that sense there, any demand for Canadian goods is going to be a demand for Canadian dollars. Oh, we already see kind of where this kind of flips around on itself, is that on the flip side, our supply of euros is going to be European or foreign demand for... Canadian dollars. That is our supply of euros, right? The supply of euros that we have available to us is the European demand for Canadian dollars. They're going to have to offset each other. They're going to have to match each other in that way there. Okay, there we go. We have that. We have this being popped up here. The big thing to keep in mind is even though this is there as a reciprocal, our focus, right? Our big focus in taking a look at this is that we are looking at the supply of euros because we're talking about the market for foreign exchange. We're not talking about the market for Canadian dollars. We're talking about the market for foreign exchange. And I know I probably sound like a broken record saying this several times now. It's an important distinction and it's a big kind of stumbling block where students typically fall into trouble with this whole modeling process is they get stuck thinking about it as a market for Canadian dollars when that's not the case. It's a market for foreign currency, foreign currency. So, okay, the big thing to kind of keep in mind then is that, hey, whenever Europeans want Canadian stuff, they are offering up their currency, euros, right? They're saying, hey, hey, I want Canadian stuff. Here, I'll give you a bunch of euros if you can give me a bunch of Canadian dollars. And in those Canadian dollars, I can then buy Canadian things. So, okay. In that sense there, the supply of foreign exchange, or inversely, that demand for Canadian dollars, it's going to arise from Canada's sale of goods, services, and assets to the world. So that is, it's going to be determined, really, the supply of euros is going to be determined by our Canadian exports 
right? So how much goods and services we're selling to Europe. The more stuff that we're selling to Europe, that's the more demand for Canadian goods, that's more demand for Canadian dollars, that's more euros being supplied in this market for foreign exchange. It's also going to depend on asset movement. So it's also going to be depending on Canadian asset flows. Right? So these are our financial these are our financial services. These are our Canadian bonds, right? And we're living in a simplified world where bonds are the only kind of financial asset we consider. So in this case here, hey, if all of a sudden there is a lot of demand for Canadian assets, hey, a lot of demand for Canadian assets, that is a capital inflow. Well, hey, if there's all of a sudden this capital inflow, a lot of demand for Canadian assets, well, then we're going to have an increased supply of euros. So again, the way to think of that. Finally, and one we're not going to play around with too much, is that there's also going to be reserve currency. Reserve currency. And this is going to be banks or firms, individuals even, they often hold a level of foreign reserve. Right? You think about this, you go to your local bank, your local little branch, and you're going on a trip, maybe not so much these days, but you're going on a trip abroad. And you say, hey, I need to buy X amount in foreign currency. Typically, as long as it's a foreign currency that's you know a typical travel destination, the bank actually has some of it just sitting there. And they are saying, okay, sure, we'll exchange Canadian dollars for euros at this rate. And you go about your trade and you walk out with a bunch of a bunch of euros, right? And that there is because, of course, the bank was just holding a bunch of foreign currency as just reserve. In the same way, European banks are going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be holding a bunch of Canadian dollars in reserve, just holding on to it in case their clients need Canadian dollars. So, hey, the more that they think their clients are going to need Canadian dollars, the more they're going to be supplying euros in order to buy those Canadian dollars. So, again, reserve currency is going to influence, is going to influence that, uh, that supply of euros. Okay, so how exactly does this work out if we want to think about these, these kind of aspects of our supply of foreign exchange? Well, okay, let's, let's take a look here. Let's take a look at our graph and take a look at what's happening. So, okay, first of all, we have our vertical axis, which is our exchange rate today, which, keep in mind, is our domestic over foreign. So, okay, domestic over foreign, in our case there, what's that? That is dollars per euro. So, okay, that's our price. That is the price of a euro. On our horizontal, this is going to be the quantity of euros from hey very very few to lots and lots and lots of euros okay the thing we have to keep in mind with this vertical axis is that when we look at exchange rates this way it's kind of it gets a little bit confusing in the sense when we talk about appreciation and depreciation that is, the way that this is set up, because we're talking about euros, well, in the respect of an appreciating euro, as the euro appreciates, well, we need more Canadian dollars to buy a euro, so an appreciating euro is as the price goes up. Very similarly, a depreciating euro, you need fewer Canadian dollars to buy a single euro, so as the euro depreciates, our exchange rate goes down. The problem is, is that, okay, we are talking about the market for foreign exchange, the market for euros, but we're in Canada and we really care about the Canadian dollar. And so in that case there, the issue arises because an appreciation of the Canadian dollar. So, okay, if the Canadian dollar appreciates, well, appreciates, you have in your mind, appreciation is up. Well, okay, if the Canadian dollar appreciates, we actually need fewer Canadian dollars to buy a euro. That is, an appreciation is a decrease in our exchange rate. So that would be an appreciation, right? A bit backwards from how you would typically think of this. 
Very similarly, if we're talking about a depreciation of Canadian dollars, well, a depreciation of Canadian dollars means that the Canadian dollar is not worth as much as it used to be. So we now need more Canadian dollars to buy a single euro. So if we need more Canadian to buy a single euro, our exchange rate actually rises. And so that would be, if our exchange rate is going up, that is a depreciation of Canadian dollars. So a bit, bit of backwards kind of way of thinking about this as, as we go through the whole process. Okay, now that being said, let's start off by presuming that we are at some point, that we have some current exchange rate, and let's just change the exchange rate and kind of talk about what's going to happen with this supply of euros. So let's pick a point, and let's pick a point, just something like that. So to kind of reference it, we'll say there's some exchange rate, there is some quantity of euros that exist all together. Okay, from here, let's increase the exchange rate. That is, let's depreciate the Canadian dollar. Okay, let's think about that. I just said I want to depreciate the Canadian dollar. What does a depreciation mean? What does a depreciating Canadian dollar mean? And let's just think about this in terms of our exports. Well, if the Canadian dollar is depreciating, our Canadian goods, from a European perspective, are Canadian goods going to be relatively cheap or are they going to be relatively expensive? If the Canadian dollar is depreciated, well, that is Canadian stuff looks cheap. So if Canadian stuff looks cheap, well, Europeans are going to want to buy more Canadian stuff more Canadian stuff, therefore our exports are going to be going up. Hey, hey, if our exports are going to be going up, that is, Europeans want to buy more Canadian stuff, in order to buy more Canadian stuff, they need more Canadian dollars. That is, if they need more Canadian dollars, how do they get those more Canadian dollars? They need to supply more euros. So in that case there, we witness that, hey, is the exchange rate goes up as our dollar depreciates the amount of euros supplied increases and we get a upward a positive slope between these two of course the opposite would also be true right say we had an appreciation of the canadian dollar if we had an appreciation of the Canadian dollar, well, now all of a sudden, the Canadian dollar is appreciated, all else equal, meaning that, hey, if we want to, again, think about it just strictly from the export scene, Canadian dollar is appreciated, Canadian dollar is now worth more, that is, Canadian stuff now looks more expensive. So, hey, if Canadian stuff looks more expensive, all else equal, uh, Europeans are going to want fewer Canadian things. If they're buying fewer Canadian things, they're demanding fewer Canadian dollars, which means they're supplying fewer Canadian dollars altogether. If they're supplying fewer, sorry, not supplying fewer Canadian dollars, supplying fewer euros altogether. So in that case there, the supply of euros falls. As we have an appreciation of our exchange rate, our supply of euros begins to fall. And we have, as such, no real surprise here. We're talking about the supply of foreign exchange, and we get this upward sloping curve. That is, we have this positive relationship between exchange rates and quantity exchanged. So we get our supply curve upward sloping. Uh, can I fit it between all three of these points here if I kind of lined it up? Uh, not really. But we see we get this upward sloping, this positive relationship between our exchange rate and the supply of foreign currency. Okay, let's flip this around now and let's talk about our other one. Let's talk about our demand for foreign exchange. Our demand, in this case here, our foreign exchange we're talking about is euros. So let's talk about our demand for euros. So let's go jump and talk about that. So again, in this case here, we're talking about our market for foreign exchange. So here we're looking at our demand for foreign exchange. And so that there in our case here that we're talking about, our foreign exchange in specific is euros. 
And again, keep in mind, hey, in the previous case, we said our supply of euros was the demand for Canadian dollars, right? The amount of euros they supplied was going to be equal to the amount of Canadian dollars they demanded. In the same kind of way here, our demand for euros, well, every time we demand a euro from their perspective, we are supplying Canadian dollars. Every time we say, hey, I want to buy a euro, I'm supplying a Canadian dollar in order to buy that euro. So again, we have this inverse relationship between the two, keeping in mind the market that we're actually evaluating is the market for foreign exchange, not the market for Canadian dollars. It's often helpful to think about what's happening to the Canadian dollar, but we always have to invert it in order to get the market we're actually interested in. And in this case here, hey, because it's just the inverse, our big kind of things that are going to influence this are going to be again, hey, how many euros do we want? Well, this is going to be dependent on, instead of our exports, this is going to be depending on our imports, right? And specifically, how many European imports we want. Hey, if we have more demand for European goods, that's more demand for euros, well, we're going to have to supply more Canadian dollars in order to get that, right? You see how that kind of works through. Again, it's going to be dependent on asset flows. If European bonds look really attractive and we want to buy lots of European bonds, well, in order to buy European bonds, we need euros. So in that case there, we would demand euros in order to demand European bonds. In that case there, that would be increased capital outflows. Our previous case was increased capital inflows. This case, increased capital outflows. Right? Capital inflows, capital outflows. And then again, finally, is going to be reserve currency. And again, same kind of idea here. If Canadian banks want to hold more and more and more euros because, hey, more Canadians are traveling to Europe and more businesses are doing business with Europe, well, they're just going to be holding more euros just on reserve. That's an increased demand for euros altogether. And so in that case there, it would be increasing our demand. Let's, uh, let's take a look at how this all works together. Again, we'll take a look at our market for foreign exchange. We're going to have our exchange rate today, which is, again, how many dollars it takes to buy a euro. And that's going to be in respect to the quantity of euros. That's the quantity of foreign exchange that we're dealing with. In this case here, again, we're just going to start at a point. And from this point, we're going to kind of work out what happens as our dollar either appreciates or depreciates. And again, just kind of walk through, talk through, think about the kind of natural effects based off what we already know about exchange rates and the impacts they have on exports, imports, etc. So let's take a look at this. Let's suppose we start off with the Canadian dollar, right? The Canadian dollar depreciates. So if the Canadian dollar depreciates, the Canadian dollar begins to become worth less and less and less. Okay, think about now we're talking about the demand side. Are we going to want to buy more foreign stuff or fewer foreign things if our Canadian dollar is not worth as much? Keeping in mind what that means, if our Canadian dollar is not worth as much, that means foreign things look expensive. Right, Foreign things now look expensive. If foreign things now look expensive, well then, hey, expensive foreign stuff, ah, uh, that's, that's not really good. Expensive foreign stuff, that's going to mean that we are going to get less foreign things. So if we want less foreign things, we are going to import less stuff. Okay. If we're importing less stuff, hey, the reason we're importing less stuff, hey, because foreign stuff is more expensive, less foreign things, what does it all mean? Well, hey, if I get less foreign goods and services, I need fewer, I need less foreign currency. So my demand for this foreign goods is going to be lower, right? Because, hey, less demand for foreign goods, less demand for foreign currency. But, oh, hey, wait, 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 wait. We're talking about a depreciation. Which way 
is a depreciation. Again, keeping in mind, this is kind of reversed. A depreciating Canadian dollar is an increase in our exchange rate. So in that case there, we would have a new point that is less quantity exchanged, higher exchange rate. And right, we see in this case here, we're starting to build this negative relationship between exchange rates and quantity exchanged. Again, shouldn't be a huge surprise. It's our typical kind of demand curve situation. To flip it around, let's talk about an appreciating Canadian dollar. So if the Canadian if the Canadian dollar appreciates, right? This is the kind of case where all of a sudden the Canadian dollar is worth more and more and more. You can buy more foreign currency for a single Canadian currency. Hey, this is the case where foreign stuff starts to look cheap. This is the case where all of a sudden you're doing your online shopping and you're like, oh, I can import stuff from the U.S. I can import stuff from Europe because our Canadian dollar looks so good. Foreign stuff looks cheap. If foreign stuff looks cheap. Well, I'm going to demand more foreign stuff, so my imports are going to go up. As I demand more foreign stuff, well, I'm also demanding more foreign currency. So in that case there, as I appreciate, I increase my demand for foreign exchange, for foreign currency. Again, an appreciation is a drop in our exchange rate in this sense here. So, right, depreciation was a rise, appreciation is a drop. So we get a new point somewhere like that. More quantity exchanged, lower exchange rate. Connecting it all, well, of course, we're going to get our demand for foreign exchange. Now, let's see if I can actually get that through all those dots there. Maybe not. There we go. I yeah, kind of kind of got it roughly as a linear line. Freehanding it, that's not too bad. So again, we get our relationship there between our demand, the exchange rate, and what's going on all together. Of course, what we have to do next is we need to bring this all together. And by bringing this all together, we can determine our equilibrium exchange rate. So let's take a look at that. And it's going to be relatively quick to take a look at this because... It's something we've been doing a lot this semester. So taking a look at our exchange rate today, we have that as again, Canadian to Euro. And that is again, our quantity of Euros, right? We're always labeling our axes. If we don't label our axes, we have no idea really what this means. We have downward sloping. We have our demand. And again, keep in mind, this is our demand for Euros. We have upward sloping our supply. And again, keeping in mind that this is our supply of euros, how many euros are supplied all together. And where the two intersect, we get our equilibrium exchange rate and we get our equilibrium quantity exchanged. So we'll call that ET and I'll call it ET prime. That's the exchange rate today and the prime just to note that, hey, it's, it's our equilibrium one. And right, of course, we would also have a quantity today prime. And that's, of course, the quantity of euros exchanged. That's how many euros we're buying and selling, not necessarily the quantity of US dollar, or sorry, US, the amount of Canadian dollars, the amount of euros that we're buying or selling. Okay, so from here, from here, what happens, right? We see that exchange rates are not fixed. We see that exchange rates change. And if you are somebody who maybe has a trip coming up one day, you end up watching exchange rates to see what they're doing. And you notice that, hey, they actually tend to fluctuate day to day. They actually are not relative. Oh, they can be somewhat stable. They won't change massively day to day, but they do change. So what's going on? What is some determinants? What causes these exchange rates to move around? Okay, so in explaining these determinants, we don't actually need to separate it, right? In the past, we've kind of said, okay, what are some determinants of supply versus what are some determinants of demand? And we've separated the two out. And we've said, okay, here's the stuff that affects supply. Here's the stuff that affects demand. Hopefully you see that that won't actually really work in this case because, right, as we kind of saw as we were building our supply and our demand curves is that, while this is the supply of euros, 
This is actually the demand for Canadian dollars. And while this is the demand for euros, this is actually the supply of Canadian dollars, right? So that is, hey, anything that affects, they're going to be the same determinants. They have to be the same determinants just in the flip model. So in order to take a look at these determinants and the things that are going to fluctuate this model around, what we need to go do, what we need to go take a look at is really the big kind of price pressures. And okay, I kind of gave that away. Our categories that we're going to be evaluating are going to be through prices. And this is prices of goods and services. So this is to our goods and services markets and how changes in the prices of goods and services will then end up influencing our exchange rates. It will also be through our capital flows. Through our capital flows and through changes in capital flows, this will also change our exchange rates. And right, one of the big things that can influence these capital flows is, of course, our interest rate. And then finally, the last kind of big determinant that we'll look at that influences these is just structural changes, right? These are just massive economic structural changes and just the way that we structure our economy altogether. If it's, hey, just this country, this economy is known for just being really good for business, a really great place to start a business in, a really great place to park your money, mm -hmm. given just the laws, the regulations, the legal framework, all of that, it's just going to be attracting resources and thus you're going to have a greater supply of that foreign exchange. If it's the other way, if it's like, ah, this is not somewhere you want to keep your money. It's not a safe place to have your money. You don't want it. Well, then in that case there, you're going to have a lot of money leaving and you're going to have a lot of demand for that foreign exchange instead, right? Because people don't want to leave. They want to leave the domestic currency. So they want more of that foreign currency instead. So kind of our three umbrella categories that we're going to look at as we go and discuss determinants, shocks to our exchange rate. Let's start off. Let's start off by taking a look at our prices of goods and services. And there's three scenarios that we want to take a look at. And right, really the big thing that you got to keep in mind is that what is being kind of held up in this prices of goods and services is our whole law of one price. And if we keep in mind, we talk, we brought up this whole idea of the law of one price back when we talked about trade, and that is that, hey, anytime we have international trade, there has to be, for this internationally traded good, one price that is held up, such that we would say, hey, our price domestic equals our exchange rate times the price foreign. And anytime we have a change in prices, right, we're going to have our exchange rate adjusting in order to compensate for that. So really all of these prices of goods and services, what we're getting at really is coming back to this law of one price. But let's take a look at these. Let's talk through these. First thing to take a look at is going to be a change in and change in the price of a global good. And so in this case here, what I mean by a global good, I mean that this is a good that is just homogenous, meaning the same. It doesn't matter if this good is produced in Canada, in the US, in Norway, in China, doesn't matter where this good comes from, it is end of the day the same thing. Um, an example of this can be most agricultural goods. An example of this can be many natural resources. So, for example, um, oil, right? There, and you might say, okay, but yeah, there are slight differences. Like Alberta crude is a bit dirtier. It's a bit harder to refine than some of the other crude. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. But generally speaking, we can say that, hey, oil is just a globally traded commodity with very little difference between Albertan oil or Norwegian oil or Nigerian oil or Texan oil, etc., 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 right? Not entirely true, but we can wave our hands and say that's the case. Okay. If that's the case, though, let's suppose that the price of oil goes up. Well, okay, if the price of oil goes up and hey, you need to buy oil. It's not like it's just Alberta oil that goes up, just Canadian oil that goes up. It's all oil that goes up across the board. 
is you're going to try to maintain roughly the same quantity of oil that you're buying, right? Technically your demand for oil will drop a little, but as the price of oil rises, if we're trying to maintain this quantity of oil initially, well, the only way that you can keep buying more oil is by offering more euros, right? Because now all of a sudden it costs more Canadian dollars to buy one barrel. So hey, if it costs more Canadian dollars to buy one barrel and you still want to buy this one barrel, you need to start offering up more euros in order to buy this one barrel. So what exactly does that mean? What exactly does this have as an impact on our market? Well, okay, in this case here, Price of oil went up, and here we're specifically talking about Canadian, well, world oil, but the impact it's going to have on the Canadian market. So, okay, price of oil goes up, meaning that it now costs more foreign currency in order to buy one Canadian barrel of oil. So in that case there, they're offering up more of their foreign currency. That is, they are supplying more euros. If they're supplying more euros, what does that do? That's going to increase our supply of euros. As that increases our supply of euros, what's the effect? We're going to have our supply of euros prime. And if we jump from equilibrium to equilibrium, we find that our, can, our exchange rate has fallen. So price of oil goes up, exchange rate falls. Okay, keep in mind, what does a falling exchange rate mean in this case here? Because this exchange rate is the price of foreign exchange, that is the price of euros. So this falling exchange rate, this means that we've witnessed an appreciation of the Canadian dollar. Right? The Canadian dollar has appreciated due to this, due to this global increase in the price of oil. And this is something we witness, right? This is something we witness every time the oil price changes. Oil is a massive Canadian export. When the global price of oil changes, our currency, our exchange rate changes as well. Okay, to think about it the other way, right? Hey, we want more Canadian oil. In order to get more Canadian oil, well, we don't necessarily want more Canadian oil. We have to pay more for the same Canadian oil. That's the better way to put it. We have to pay more for the same Canadian oil because we have to pay more. We need more Canadian dollars in order to pay more. That's an increase of demand for Canadian dollars. Increased demand for Canadian dollars. So, hey, keep in mind that supply is just the inverse of demand for dollars. And we, we see that we see that there. Demand for dollars increases, right? Shifts to the right, a shift to the right is an increase. So it works out in both ways, but keep in mind we're talking about the we're talking about the exchange, the market for foreign exchange, right? So in this case here, the market for euros. Okay, let's go take a look at another example here. So in this case, instead of just a change in a global price, we're going to be taking a look at a change in price of, and we're going to say domestic good. Let me make a word that a bit better. Maybe we can say a change in the price of imports. Let's say that. A change in the price of imports. And in this case here, what we're going to presume is that, hey, some of the stuff that we are importing, and here we're talking about, right, we're Canada, we're our domestic one, is that these imports might be kind of country specific. That is, let's suppose that, hey, Volkswagen VW is produced in Germany primarily in the Eurozone. And let's suppose that all else equal, the price of Volkswagens increases. But okay, keep in mind, I'm not saying that the price of cars increases. That is, price of Ford, price of GM, price of Honda, price of Toyota. This is, they're all staying the same. The only thing in the world that's changing is the price of a Volkswagen. We need to work out then, okay, if the price of a Volkswagen is going up, that would be one of our Canadian imports from Europe, right? From our country that has our foreign exchange that we're interested in. If this price of import goes up, we need to work out, well, what does this do to our exchange rate? 
And in this case, it gets a little bit tricky because in this case, we actually have two very opposite scenarios that can arise. And let's, let's take a look at these two opposite scenarios. These two opposite scenarios are based off of whether or not we as Canadians view this foreign good. Do we view this foreign good as elastic or inelastic? And sorry, I shouldn't say that we view it, it's that our demand for it is either elastic or inelastic. And whoa, these are these are micro concepts. If you haven't taken micro yet, you're completely like, I don't know what that means. And if you have taken micro, you're like, oh no, elasticity, right? That's usually a bad chapter for many, many students. But let's simplify it here, right? We're not going to get into all the details and the nuts and bolts of elasticity. What we really mean is by elastic, elastic is just going to be, let's just write this here. Elastic is that we are price sensitive. That is that our demand, our quantity demanded is very sensitive to the price. That, hey, if all of a sudden the price goes up, we go, hey, yeah, no, sorry, I don't want it anymore, right? Think of chocolate bars. If, you're, you know, chocolate bars are a dollar, you're like, yeah, okay, I'll grab a chocolate bar at the checkout. If chocolate bars go up to 250 now you're looking at that chocolate bar at the checkout and you're going, I don't really know if it's worth it anymore, right? You're sensitive to that change in price. The other case of that would be inelastic. And inelastic would be that we are not price sensitive. That is the price can change and sometimes can be changed quite drastically, but will hardly change the amount that we end up consuming of it. And again, an example of this would be something like gasoline, right? Price of gasoline can increase, increase quite drastically, right? Even if we take a look over the last year. In the last year, and again, it's a funny year because we've had our pandemic and our lockdown, but over the last year, price of gas was as low as 80 cents all the way up to a buck 50. Despite this drastic change, that's almost a 100% increase in the price of gas over the year. Despite that, our quantity of gas consumed stays about the same, right? We don't drastically cut back on our gas consumption because the price doubles. It, it hardly is impacted. So that's really what we're getting at. And we can kind of visualize this as, okay, if we're elastic, price goes up, quantity demanded. I'm going to do a huge arrow here to say, hey, price goes up by some amount. This is a bigger change in my quantity demanded, right? Drastically false. We're inelastic. Price goes up, and I'm trying to keep these two arrows the same size to kind of signify, right, an equivalent price increase. My quantity demanded, it still goes down because, hey, I'm going to have less, but it's a tiny change, right? And depending on the degree of inelasticity, it may be close to zero, but tiny change. So we have this result going on there. Okay, what does this all work out to? What does this all work out to? Well, okay, let's let's go back to our example and let's let's work through this. Let's suppose to start off that our demand for Volkswagens are elastic. So that is, we are sensitive to the price of Volkswagens. That is, we're like, hey, you know what? Yeah, sure, I really like the Jetta. But if the price of the Jetta went up drastically, I'd just go buy a Civic instead. Right? I'm not, I don't love the Jetta that much. So, okay, if that was the case. We would have price of Volkswagen going up, but we would have our quantity demanded disproportionately falling. And okay, what we're really interested then in is our total expenditure on Volkswagens, how much we're actually spending in total on Volkswagen. So okay, we can work that out. Our total expenditure, that is just price times quantity. But okay, what's happened to our total expenditure? And this word's like, uh-oh, this has gone up, that's got, gone down. Uh, we have two effects going on. Which one wins out? Well, okay, this is where this kind of relative arrows really helps to pay off. Price has gone up, but quantity demanded has dropped even more significantly. The bigger arrow wins, right? So in this case here, our total expenditure on Volkswagens has actually fallen. We are expending less on Volkswagens, right? You can see this. We have this price increase. 
but a drastic quantity drop. That drop overrules this increase, giving us altogether a drop in the amount of money that we're expending on Volkswagens. Okay, where does all this fit in, right? Where does all this fit in? Well, in this case, we're talking about, hey, we want to buy a European good, and because of this price change, we want to expend less Canadian dollars on this European good. So if we want to expend less Canadian dollars on this European good, we're going to have fewer, less, right? Less demand for euros. I want to buy fewer dollars worth of European cars. If I want to buy fewer dollars worth of European cars, I'm going to be demanding fewer, fewer euros. Okay. If all that made sense, if all that worked through, right? Total expenditure down, less Canadian dollars being spent, less money being spent on European cars means fewer euros needed. Fewer euros needed means fewer, less demand for those euros. So going up here, what does that work out to? Less demand for European cars, less demand for euros. We have our demand curve shifting to the left. And if our demand curve is shifting to the left, what do we have? Well, we have again a drop in our exchange rate. A drop in our exchange rate is again an appreciation of the Canadian dollar. Okay, I want to take a moment here to kind of be like, hey, why is this one a demand shock? Why was the last one a supply shock? Okay, the rationale behind the two is that in our first scenario, oh, let's use the right tool. In our first scenario, we were talking about a change in a global price, which was a Canadian export, right? So because it was a Canadian export, that was going to influence our supply of euros, how many euros were supplied to buy our Canadian export. In this second scenario that we just went through right now, we're talking about the change in a foreign import price. Because we're talking about the change in a foreign import price, well, that's going to depend on the amount of euros that we demand because we need euros in order to buy this European good. We could, we could have worked through this example as a change in a domestic export price, right? Let's suppose, let's suppose that there is a Canadian, Canadian toques and Canadian toques are very different than any kind of toque that you can make or buy from any other country in the world. And now there's a change in the price of Canadian toques. Well, again, depending on whether this demand for Canadian toques is elastic or inelastic, that is right, do people actually see Canadian toques as different from American toques, different from European toques, different from toques created other places, right? Depending on this, well, whether it's elastic or inelastic is going to depend on how much our total expenditure on toques changes. And in this case here, because it's going to be how much Canadian toques we buy, that scenario would influence our supply of euros. So again, it just depends on which country we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about, hey, stuff that we are buying from Europe, stuff that Europe is exporting. So in that case there, because we're talking about imports, we're talking about our demand. So just a bit to kind of keep straight in that bit there. Okay, what about the other scenario? What about if we have inelastic what if we have inelastic demand for Volkswagens? Let's take a look at that. So if our demand for Volkswagens is inelastic, let me just move this down to make a little bit more room. We'll go right down below there. So if our demand for Volkswagens is inelastic, well, we still have that this whole price of Volkswagen has gone up, right? That, that's unavoidable. That's what we've said our whole situation is. Price has risen. But in this case, Canadians on whole, we look at Volkswagens and we go, no, nope, they're one of a kind car. Fine, European engineering, much better than a Honda, much better than anything else. Sure, they've gone up in price, but I'm still going to buy them because for whatever reason, I'm just, I really like my Volkswagens. So in that case there, our quantity demanded of Volkswagens, it will drop. Some people will back out of this for sure, but 
it's just going to drop a little. It's not going to have a drastic change in our quantity demanded because again, it's inelastic, which means that we're not price sensitive. So we're not changing our quantity consumed very much for a change in the price. Again, how does that work out? Well, we want to take a look at how much money we're spending on foreign goods. And so total expenditures, again, price times quantity. Our price goes up. Our quantity goes down just a little bit. So again, which one wins out? The bigger arrow wins out. So in this case here, our total expenditure would actually rise. So price of Volkswagens has gone up. As price of Volkswagen has gone up because we view Volkswagens in an inelastic sense. We say, yep, no, nothing compares. There are no substitutes to Volkswagens. We have very little change in the amount of Volkswagens we buy because there's very little change. We end up just spending more money on fewer Volkswagens. So as a result of that, if we're spending more money, we are really supplying more Canadian dollars or on the other way of that, we're demanding more euros, right? Because our total expenditure is up. Either we're yeah, offering more Canadian dollars, supply of Canadian dollars, or demanding more euros. Either way, we work out that what the final impact is, is demand to the right. Right in this case here, because we're demanding more euros to buy more Volkswagen, not to buy more Volkswagen, to spend more on Volkswagens. Or alternatively, we're supplying more Canadian dollars as we are trying to spend more money on our Volkswagens. Either way, the final impact of that is that the exchange rate rises, keeping in mind that a rising exchange rate would be a depreciation of the Canadian dollar, right? So we have this depreciating effect of the Canadian dollar in this scenario here. So this is probably one of the most difficult ones to kind of keep in mind as we work through this is, okay, elastic, inelastic. What I find is really the big helping point is to kind of work through kind of these relative er er arrows, elastic goods, big change in quantity demanded, inelastic goods, tiny change in quantity demanded, and then as we work through our total expenditure, how much money we're spending on that good or service, well, the bigger arrow is the one that always wins out, right? It's always the bigger arrow that wins out, causing our impact on total expenditure. And then we're saying, okay, hey, look, less total expenditure, less Canadian dollars supplied or fewer euros demanded, hey, all of that decrease in demand more Canadian dollars spent on Volkswagens, that is more Canadian dollars supplied, or alternatively with our model, more euros demanded. Well, more euros demanded means an increase in demand. So again, we have that impact on a price of goods or service based off the relative elasticity of demand. Okay, so a few little cases there. The last one we're gonna consider is changes in overall price levels. So let's clean up and let's take a look at our last price effect of a price on this case here. Okay, so in our final case for an effect on change in prices of goods and services, it's going to be just general change in the price level of a region. And really, there's going to be three possible scenarios that end up happening with this, right? Price levels are increasing faster in one region. Price levels are not at all in another or vice versa. And then finally, just, hey, we do have inflation in both, but one's faster than the other. So those are essentially the three that we'll have. So let's just kind of abbreviate that. We'll say inflation in Europe, none in Canada. Inflation in Canada, none in Europe. Or the final case is that something like, and this would go either way, inflation in Europe is greater than inflation in Canada. And of course, we could do that the opposite way too. Essentially just saying, hey, inflation in one region is greater than the inflation in another region. So three kind of scenarios to look at. And really what we'll see is that, hey, this case is just a simplification, or not a simplification, but rather just an extension of these first cases. The first case is rather a simplification of the latter case. That's really what it is. 
What we have to further presume in this case is that, hey, as we have a change in inflation, a change in price levels, we have to assume that we have elastic demand, right? And that is, this really does kind of make sense, is that on whole for all the goods made in Europe, some of those goods we might have inelastic demand for, but on whole, we're going to have elastic demand. If price of European bread goes up, well, we're going to substitute to domestic bread, to your American bread, to Asian bread, to, right, there's so many other players out there that we could just substitute to somebody else. So we're not stuck paying more on whole just because European bread costs more. We're just going to, okay, we're going to switch. So let's take a look at this scenario and let's take a look at this scenario for our first case, which is just going to be all of a sudden Europe is having inflation. Canada is not. And I, okay, this is a bullet point. This isn't minus. This isn't negative inflation in Europe. It's just the bullet point of saying, hey, we have inflation in Europe and no inflation in Canada. So, okay, what does that mean? That means that euro prices are rising. So, okay, if European prices are rising, European things are looking more expensive. If European things are looking more expensive and we kind of have this elastic, right, quantity down. Oh, let's be elastic. Let's really make that bold quantity really down. So in that case there, our total expenditure on European stuff is down. We are demanding fewer, fewer euros, right? We don't need as many euros because we're not spending as much money on European stuff. So that is going to be our demand for euros is going to the left. So we can work that out there. Demand for euros going to the left. Let's, let's uh, draw that there. Demand for euros to the left. There we go. Okay, but that's not the only thing, right? What we're actually having in conjunction to this is, yes, European prices are going up, so we have less demand for euros, but we have that kind of relative other side. European goods are expensive, so we don't want to buy them, right? So our imports of European goods drop, right? You can think of it that way. Imports of euro down. That's why our demand for euros is down. But at the same time, from a European perspective, Canadian goods look cheap. Right? Because all their stuff is becoming more and more expensive, all our Canadian stuff is becoming more and more cheap. So in that case there, well, they're going to want to buy more Canadian stuff. So that's going to be exports are going to go up. As our exports go up, right, okay, exports, in order for them to be able to buy our stuff, they need to be able to first supply euros in order to get Canadian dollars. So that is going to be our supply of euros will increase. So, okay, what, what effect does that have? Well, let's take a look here. Supply of euros will increase. So we have supply of euros increasing so we have a decrease in the demand for euros an increase in the supply of euros together right we see how we're a bit ambiguous as to what our final quantity exchange would be but we can be fairly certain that the final effect is going to be ultimately a decrease in our exchange rate that is a decrease in the exchange rate would be an appreciation of the Canadian dollar or a depreciation of the country experiencing the inflation, right? So a depreciation of the country experiencing the inflation. If we work through the opposite case where we had inflation in Canada, well, Canadian prices, right? We can just do a quick kind of walkthrough of that. If we had inflation in Canada, that is Canadian prices are going up. So, hey, foreigners are saying, yeah, your stuff looks expensive. We don't want to buy it. So that is exports down. So supply of euros to the left. At the same time, because Canadian prices are going up, that means foreign stuff looks cheap. So that's going to be imports are going to rise. And that means that demand for euros is going to increase. 
So right, if we wanted to work through that scenario, supply down, your uh, demand up, uh, no matter how we cut that, very similar, let's just quickly clean this guy up and we can work through that new scenario here. There we go, so our initial equilibrium. New scenario, we said demand is gonna increase. Well, we can show that there. And we said our supply was going to decrease. Well, again, we can show that. Again, ambiguous as to what the impact is gonna be on our quantity exchange, but fairly straightforward that the impact is gonna be an increase in the exchange rate. And that is, in this case here, the Canadian economy was the one experiencing inflation. So because the Canadian dollar or Canadian economy was experiencing inflation, we witnessed a depreciation of our dollar. So two different scenarios going on there. What about the final case? Well, that is, we have inflation in both regions. Well, if we have inflation in both regions, it really just comes down to which one has greater inflation. If we have, as we have it written there, inflation in Europe is greater than inflation in Canada, well then that's essentially just going to simplify down to this scenario here, that first case, that essentially Canada has no inflation and Europe has all the inflation, right? That's our first scenario. If we have instead this case where inflation in Canada is greater than inflation in Europe, well, then we're dealing with that case there, where, hey, we have inflation in Canada and no inflation in Europe. That's essentially how we can think about it, is that it just kind of simplifies to one way or another. Okay, so that does us looking at our different prices and different impacts on relative prices between regions and the effects it has on the exchange rate. Let's jump over and let's take a look at the impacts on capital flows. So before we jump over to capital flows, what we've noticed is on this left-hand side, I've just kind of done a simplified shorthand of what the three kind of prices on goods and services and the effect that they ended up having. Well, sorry, not the effect they ended up having that we had to work through, but rather the three big areas. So first of all, we took a look at change in a world price of a good. That was our oil example. And in this, we presume that, hey, it was inelastic. That is, hey, there was no substitutes to oil. If price of oil went up, we couldn't substitute to something else. We were just stuck paying this higher price, and we worked through that. We never explicitly said that oil was inelastic, but, right, you're looking at this eta D, right? That's what that is. That's just short form. Eta is our typical script for elasticity. D for demand. So, okay, the elasticity of demand less than one, meaning that it is inelastic, not price sensitive. Don't get too caught up about, hey, A to D less than one, what does that mean? I'm not gonna throw into a question, presume the price of this good has a price elasticity of 1.25, and you're like, what does that mean? No, 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 I will always tell you elastic or inelastic. This is just my shorthand for in here, so I didn't have to write so much. We then went through, okay, change in the price of an export or an import good. We took a look at a case where it could be elastic. So again, just for your own information, that'd be A to D greater than one or inelastic, that is A to D less than one. Right, and we worked through that, the impacts that that would have depending on relative elasticity of that good. Finally, we took a look at changes in price levels, that is really relative rates of inflation between two different economies. And in that case there, we presumed that, hey, we presume that goods are elastic. That is, hey, if there all of a sudden there's huge inflation in the Eurozone, well, maybe we could substitute and buy some of these goods from Africa, China, Great Britain, US, South America instead, right? So just because there's great inflation in one area doesn't mean we're stuck dealing with them. So we presumed elastic demand in that case there. Okay. Well, let's jump over to capital flows though. Ultimately in capital flows, what we're taking a look at is just, well, in this case, what is gonna be known as kind of our interest rate parity. And in this is we can really have uh, either short-term or long-term kind of changes in, in capital flows. So in this case here, let's talk about 
a short-term capital movement. Let's talk about a short-term capital movement. So, uh, short-term capital movement. This here primarily is due to changes in interest rate, and we'll take a look at this with our interest rate parity. And really what's going on in this short-term capital movement is all of a sudden there's a change in the interest rate. And because of this change in the interest rate, there's now a rush of capital in here or out of here in order to account for this change. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at an example of that. Let's suppose that, and right, this is something we've looked at with our whole monetary policy chapter. Let's take a look that all of a sudden our interest rate, and this is going to be our domestic interest rate, all of a sudden increases. Well, if our domestic interest rate increases, all of a sudden Canadian goods, or not Canadian goods, rather Canadian bonds look relatively attractive, right? You're getting a good yield to maturity. You're getting a good return on these Canadian bonds. So all of these European savers want to save in Canadian bonds and get this Canadian interest rate. Well, in order to save their savings in Canadian bonds, they need Canadian dollars, so they need to buy Canadian dollars. In order to buy Canadian dollars, they need to supply euros. So in that case there, as the interest rate goes up, our supply of euros goes up. That is, right, a little bit deceiving when we're talking about supply, that is supply of euros goes to the right. Is supply of euros goes to the right, well, our exchange rate drops. That is, dropping exchange rate is an appreciation, right? And we've done this walkthrough, talk through before. We have just kind of jumped over that stuff. We just said, yeah, interest rate up. We want more demand for Canadian dollars to buy demand for more bonds. Or sorry, more demand for Canadian dollars because we have more demand for Canadian bonds. That's what I was trying to say. More demand for Canadian dollars, all else equal, causes the Canadian dollar to appreciate. Right? We've just now added in that, hey, that's actually an increase in the supply of euros. So, right, in that case, their increase in the supply of euros, that has pushed us to the right, causing a new equilibrium. Right? New equilibrium there. Let's take a look at that lower exchange rate, lower exchange rate, appreciation of the Canadian dollar. Let's take a look at this a bit um, using what would be known as our interest rate parity formula. Our interest rate parity formula looks something like this. So interest rate parity, IRP, interest rate parity. What we would have in this interest rate parity is we would equate one plus the interest rate domestic, so right, that's our Canadian interest rate, two B, let's uh, write it out and then I'll explain all the terms here, times one plus the interest rate, and I'm gonna go F for foreign. Okay, so what do we have going on here? We have essentially saying that, hey, the interest rate domestically must equal the foreign interest rate, once we adjust for exchange rates, where this expression here, ET, this is our exchange rate today, right? So our current exchange rate. FT, this would be a forward rate. That is, you can kind of think about this as what we would expect the exchange rate to be next year. Right, and this would be in our scenario where we're only looking at a one-year savings. Like, hey, I can either save in a one-year Canadian bond or I can save in a one-year European bond. Uh, either way, I should expect, once I adjust for exchange rates, the exact same return. And let's take a quick look to kind of show that this actually works. Let's just kind of clean up our bits here. There we go. Let's presume that we have a interest rate domestic of, what are we going to say the domestic interest rate is? The domestic interest rate is going to be 2%. Okay. We'll say the interest rate foreign is 2.5%. So, okay, it looks like, hey, the foreign bond actually has a higher interest rate than the Canadian one. But we'll see that with exchange rates, that might not actually be the case. We'll then presume that the exchange rate today is a buck 20. Keeping in mind, exchange rate, that is going to be a buck 20 dollar per euro. 
Okay. First question I could ask is, hey, based off of this for interest rate parity to hold, that is for this equality to hold, what must be this forward rate? Right, and we can just go through a little bit of algebraic voodoo, just rearranging things, and we could solve for that quite readily. And so, hey, for the first bit here, let's let's go through that. So, okay, what would we have? We would have 1.02 equals FT all over exchange rate of 1.20 times uh, foreign 1.025. So. Okay, in order to work this out, let's do our algebraic manipulation. Let's multiply, I have 1.2 in my denominator. Let's multiply both sides by 1.2. So 1.02 times 1.2 gives me on my left there 1.224 equals forward rate times 1.025. Okay, I want to get this forward rate by itself, so let's divide by the foreign interest rate. So 1.224 divided by 1.025, that gives for me 1.19. We'll carry around a few extra decimal places here. We'll go 415. Equals my future rate, right? So there we go. We can go there. 1.19415. Great. So we have that. We have all the parts of our interest rate parity formula. Let's go and actually show that this is actually equivalent returns if you invested or if you saved in either a Canadian bond or a foreign, in this case, a European bond. And let's take a look at how, at how that would work. So let's suppose you had, you had $100. And you were going to save this $100 for one year. And you did this $100 for one year in a Canadian bond. Well, you would get, in that one year time, you'd get your 100 plus your rate of, sorry, not plus, times your rate of return. So 100 times 1.02, you would have $102 in one year's time. But let's say you're looking at this and you're going, oh, okay, I get $102 in one year's time. But hey, look at this foreign exchange rate. They're offering 2.5%. That's even better, right? Well, let's take a look at what would happen. Let's take a look at what would happen. In order to go that route, you would need to, for one year, you would have to buy a European bond, right? Not a Euro bond. For those of you in finance, it's like, oh, wait, is this like a Euro bond, like the finance term? No, no, no. I just mean a European bond. Okay. So you buy, you're buying a one-year European bond. But hey, in order to buy that European bond, you need to first convert this $100 into some amount of euros. So, okay, how do we do that? And okay, so in order to convert Canadian to Euro, this is often what I see happen, is I see price Canada times our exchange rate, and then they go just go, okay, equals price foreign. And so, okay, you would go 100 times. 120, what's our units here? Dollars per euro. And then you go, okay, that is going to be 120 euros. But okay, okay, keep in mind what you just did. Let's take a look at the units here. $100 times 1.2 dollars per euro. Okay, if you follow through your units, what you've just solved for is 120 dollars squared per euro. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of a currency measured in dollar squared per euro, right? That's that's complete hogwash. That means nothing to us. So what we need to do in this case here is we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it that way. And in fact, really the way that we can keep in mind is kind of going back to our law of one price formula, which is saying, hey, price domestic equals our exchange rate times our price foreign. So, hey, in that case there, in order to get the foreign price, we can go price Canadian divided by our exchange rate to get the foreign price. So, okay, okay, we can do that. So that's 100 divided by 120 dollar per euro. What does that work out to? 100 divided by 120, well, that gives me 83, and then a whole bunch of threes. We'll just carry around three of them. 
83.33333. And again, do our units work? Well, we have dollars divided by dollars divided by euros. Oh, oh, what's happening there? Okay, if you want to follow through this in this way here, keep in mind that if we have a number divided by a fraction, we can work this out by taking the denominator and then just flipping it and multiplying it by the numerator. So that is, it is equivalent as saying dollars times euros per dollar. Right, instead of dollars divided by dollars divided by euros, it would be the same as writing this. So, hey, dollars on the top, dollars on the bottom, those guys cancel each other out. All we're left with is euros, which means, yes, this is 83.33333 euros. So we have our we have our value now. Okay, so all we've done so far is said, okay, hey, if I took my initial $100 and converted it into euros, this is how much I would have. Okay, now what we would want to do is we would want to figure out if I were to save these euros for one year, how much would I have? Well, okay, just like we had 100 times the interest rate giving me my output, I would do the same thing. I would go, okay, I would have 83333 times the rate of my savings. Well, 4 in is 0 0.25, 0 0.025, so 1.025. That's going to give me, what does that give me? What do I get in one year's time? I'm going to have in one year's time 85. 4167. Carrying around a few extra decimal places because these are still intermediate steps, right? So, okay. One year's worth of savings. I go from 100 Canadian dollars to 102 Canadian dollars. One year worth of savings. I go from 83 euros to 85 euros. And then the decimals as well. But okay, in order to be able to compare this apples to apples, I need to take this amount. And I need to convert it back into Canadian dollars because, okay, I'm Canadian. I need to spend my money in Canadian dollars. So, okay, I need to convert it back. What rate am I going to convert it back at? Well, okay, I'm not going to convert it back at this 1.2 because I'm now one year in the future. What I need to convert it back at is my future rate, right? This forward rate. And that is I need to convert it back at this rate here. And so in order to do so, how am I going to do that? Well, okay, again, keeping in mind our law of one price formula here. In this case, I know the foreign. I know the exchange rate. I am looking for the domestic. So, hey, this guy, this guy is a bit intuitively easier to work through. That is, we're going to get our new forward exchange rate so that's going to be 1.19415 times my saved amount of money a year later 854167 and what does that yield for me 1.19415 times 85.4167 i get uh, what do i get i get 102000 Three, right? So a little bit of rounding error because we cut things off early is where that three comes from. But hey, for all intents and purposes, I get 102. Meaning, hey, look at that. Was there any difference between saving my money, saving my $100 in a Canadian bond, or saving my money over in this European bond? Ah, there was no difference. In the end, I got $102 either way. That is presuming, of course, this stable foreign exchange rate, that we could predict this and that we know what this is, which interest rate parity really gives a good kind of hint that, okay, for these financial returns to be equal across all countries, we need to be able to predict this at least somewhat outside of exogenous shocks hitting our system, right? And we would expect that this risk-weighted return, that our returns irrespective of country, would be approximately equal. And just like we see here. So, okay. How do we use this then? Right, This is a big mathematical aside. You're like, uh, where does this all fit in to our model? Okay, it all fits into our model in what we were just talking about here. That, hey, interest rate goes up. We must have this change in all of that. 
And let's let's work through to see that. Let's work through to see that. And we'll work with all this math. This was really just saying, hey, we can we can show that this is actually the case. That we are indifferent between saving in Canadian and European bonds. Okay, so let's see this impact here then on our interest rate parity formula. So what did we say happened? We said that we had an increase in our domestic interest rate. So that is our left-hand side has gone up. So hey, if our left-hand side has gone up, that is we now have an inequality in our interest rate parity. Okay, if this is an inequality, it's not going to affect foreign interest rates. Foreign interest rates will not respond to a change in domestic interest rates. What will respond, right, is going to be our short-term capital flows. We're going to rush in, and what that's going to do is it's going to affect our exchange rate today. As this affects our exchange rate today, well, we're going to want these two to equal. That is, we're going to want this whole right-hand side to go up. So again, we have a quality. How do we get this whole right-hand side to go up? Well, that's going to be if this exchange rate today falls, which hey, is what exactly we worked out would happen. This exchange rate falls. As that exchange rate falls, as the Canadian dollar appreciates, as all that happens, we again get a new equality occurring. So we can kind of work through directionally how this works through with this interest rate parity formula as well. And we see the movement of capital flows. We also have long-term capital movements, right? And these long-term capital movements, these are often perceived by not changes in interest rates, so not necessarily due to this interest rate parity, but as I was kind of hinting at earlier, kind of the business environment of a given country. If a given country is more business-friendly, that is, hey, businesses, firms, investors all think it's going to be more profitable to be in Canada. Well, then capital will flow into Canada. If, right, that's going to be an increase in the supply of foreign currency. If alternatively they go, oh, Canada is not a good place to go and do business. Canada is not a good place to be. Well, then investment money is going to be leaving Canada. And as it leaves Canada, we'll have a decrease in the supply of foreign currency, right? And so be going through that way there. Okay, that does us for our capital flows. Let's take a look at our final one there. Let's take a look at these structural changes. So again, you'll notice before we jump over into taking a look at the structural that I have listed here, kind of the abbreviated Coles Notes version of our capital flows. So again, we had our short-term capital flows due to interest rate parity, so the differences in interest rates. We then also have our long-term capital flows, and I've kind of abbreviated that to just being like, hey, how business-friendly or investor-friendly is an area? That is, do we think that area is going to be very profitable, or do we think it's going to be not so profitable? Right, and that's going to um, intervene or have an effect on our long-term capital flows. Okay, what about structural? Well, these structural changes, these are just really about ease of trade, right? Ease of trade. And this is going to be ease of trade of either trade in goods and services, as we've seen here, or ease in trade in terms of capital flow. And right, this is going to be due to um, just government legislation about how easy it is. Um, anything that could affect these patterns of trade. So war could have an influence on this. Um, pandemic and lockdowns can have an influence on this. Um, the Suez Canal, where it got shut down for a few weeks, this could have an influence on this. Um, Short-lived, but same kind of idea, right? The more able that you are to increase the ease of trade, well, then the more trade that's going to occur, the more easily... You're going to be affected by these the more easily you're going to be affected by capital flows right and the easier it is to trade well typically the better it is for your country it will be a bigger appreciation of a bigger appreciation of your currency right the easier it is to trade the more money that will flow in so the greater supply of foreign currency the more difficult it is to trade well the less money that's likely to flow in so, bit of a close note, not much to say about that whole structural bit of trade there, but what could, what can occur with that just the same.
Okay, so that does us for our video on exchange rates and foreign exchange. Uh, if you have any questions as we've worked through this, of course, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to leave a message on our D2L Frequently Asked Questions page. And of course, please feel free to send me an email. I hope to do another quick video of just a few examples of working through different things that happen and how that affects the exchange rate. So watch for that video as it pops up. It'll again come up a little bit later. But this is often an abstract one. It's usually one that a lot of students have trouble with, with, okay, what curve is being impacted? What exactly does this mean for our exchange rate? So hopefully the other video on some examples will help to clarify that. Again, any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Until next time, thanks.